Thank you, Edgar. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Renaissance and IDRC for giving me this opportunity to be here today. And I would like to thank So Win, uh, Edgar, and Kimo personally for your hospitality. And thank you all for being here today. Um, the idea of having this uh, presentation is to, first of all, present an overview of Vietnam's public policy and public uh, finance and at the same time trying to be more relevant to the training programs that the Renaissance and the Fulbright School will implement later, hopefully, you know, with the funding from IDRC. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, five things today. First of all, I, I would like to give an overview of Vietnam's economy because I would like to put the public finance in context. Uh, without a bigger macroeconomy context, I don't think we can understand public finance properly. And then I'm going to go through four major uh, topics in public finance, uh, fiscal revenue, fiscal expenditure, fiscal decentralization. And then under the request of Kimmo, I'm going to talk about public finance, uh, financial management as well. <clears throat> and uh, this is a brief history of Vietnam economy since we uh, started reform in 1986. Uh, we call it Doi Mới or uh, Economic uh, Innovation, all right? We started in 1976, uh, 1986 at a pretty low level of economic performance, all right? And then if you, if you look at this, the economy grew pretty fast in the 90s, but then we got hit by the Asian financial crisis in 97, 98. Right, and the economy went down to the bottom of 4.8% in GDP growth in 99. And at that time, we implement a kind of comprehensive uh, economic reform. I'm going to go back to the public finance reform later on. But at this point, there are two major reforms, one domestic, another international. The most important domestic reform in Vietnam, actually today, until today, is enterprise law in uh, 1999. Basically, the law is you know, quite simple, nothing sophisticated. The most important thing it does was to acknowledge the right of doing business of private people. All right? And then it opened up opportunities for everyone who wants to do business, who want to get rich, and who want to take advantage of their human capital. All right? And then another very important reform is associated with the BTA, US-Vietnam Bilateral Trade Agreements that we signed in 2001. So together, these two reforms provide a new impetus for the economy that grew up pretty quickly until we was hit by another crisis, you know, the recent global financial crisis, and then the economy went down. The point I would like to make here is, if you look at Vietnam public finance reform, you will see that reform go along with the economic reform more generally. That's the first point. The second point is, when we do reform, domestic reform, and we open up our you know, trade, then we produce the best results for the economy. All right. So if you look at this, for example, here, we have mini bank reform, we have FDI law. So domestic, domestic reform is combined with the first FDI law ever in Vietnam. And here you have enterprise law and the BTA goes together. All right. So this is a very brief uh, uh, introduction to Vietnam's economic reform in the last two decades. And now, if you look at this, you can see that now FDIs play a huge role in Vietnam. And if compare Vietnam experience to other East Asian economies like South Korea, like Japan, like Taiwan, and like uh, Hong Kong and Singapore, you don't see the big role of FDI as much. You know, for example, in the 60s or 70s in South Korea or or Taiwan, FDIs account for about 
2%, 3% of the total investment in Vietnam at some point FDI accounts for 20 to 30% of total uh, investment in the country so FDI plays the very big role and if you look at this you know right now FDI plays the biggest role in terms of producing industrial output all right so FDI account for about 45% of the total Vietnam's industrial output at the time being which is the biggest sector in the economy and another thing which is quite interesting is the state sector started as the biggest the dominant force in the economy now accounts for about less than a quarter actually about 20 25 percent of total industrial production in the economies so the private sectors now is actually the most important sectors driving the economy going forward but at the same time because the political reason Vietnam is a single party you know, system, so the Communist Party still want to maintain a big state uh, sector and that is why we don't fully realize our potential. And if you, going back to the point I mentioned earlier, if you look at this picture, Vietnam, right here. So in terms of the net FDI flows, Vietnam is doing very well. So if you take you know, the absolute figures, absolute amounts of FDI, Vietnam is far you know, behind China. But you take FDI as the percentage of GDP relatively to the economic size of the country, then Vietnam is performing even you know, you know, beyond China in terms of attracting FDI. And I think that attracting FDI is one key to success. It's not everything, but it's one important factor in you know giving us you know capital expertise and spillable effects to the whole economy and another fact which is so important in vietnam as i mentioned earlier is we are in the process of integrating deeper and deeper in the regional and global economy if you look at this chart <coughs> brunei singapore vietnam and malaysia participate in almost every regional trade agreements all right and right now if you ask me what is the next big trade agreement between vietnam and other partner it's really hard to think about one because we we already signed the most important trade agreements all right with the uh, uh, asean asean plus three asean plus six or asep TPP, EV, Vietnam, FTA, South Korea, Japan, bilateral FTA. So basically we cite them all. So it's really hard to think about the next step in terms of integration process. But from the public finance perspective, it's important because trade, free trade agreements bring down tariffs for, for, for revenue. I'm going to go back to that. So this is I, I present this not only because it's important for the economy wide, but it's crucial, it's critical for budget finance as well. And uh, as I said, Vietnam is uh, increasingly open. And if you take the total import and export as the percentage of GDP, Vietnam is now one of the most open economy in the world. All right. Compared with the ASEAN, with China, you know, we are above uh, the average. And at the same time, Vietnam has been quite successful in diversifying the export markets. Now we are dealing, uh, we are trading with the US, about 22% of our export and import come from the US, and EU, ASEAN, China, Japan, and so on. And if you look at the next one, which is, I mean, my favorite chart, is if you look at the composition of export in Vietnam, the export basket has been radically transformed in the last 10 years. All right, so if you look at this, 23% come from crude oil, all right, and then 15% from uh, textile and apparel, nearly 10% from shoe, and electronics, virtually no, right, but if you look at this, Nowadays, oil accounts for about 2%. From more than 20, nearly 23% down to 2%. To 
And then if you look at this, this is electronics and mostly Samsung cell phone. So if you are using Samsung nowadays, there's a good probability that it's coming from Vietnam. All right? We produce like about 40% uh, of uh, Samsung cell phone uh, globally. All right? And then at the same time, textile garment and shoe are still important because it's, they are labor intensive and we are having a lot of uh, labor, so we are still need some kind of labor intensive industry. But if you look at this, the the, the export has been transformed and it has a lot of consequences for public finance. Right? I'm going to go back to, to this. Right, so now that is the first part about the uh, uh, Vietnam's economy. Now I'm going deeper into public finance. So let's start with revenue and expenditure picture. If you look at this, when we started reforming our economy, Revenue is about 9% of GDP, which is very low by any standard. So at that time, the public finance system in Vietnam was dysfunctional. And the question is how we overcome that. So that is one of the key questions that I'm going to address in the next couple of slides. And at the same time, the expenditure is huge, right? So if you, if you take the gap, we have about 7 more than 7% of budget deficit at this time. All right. So if you, if you look until 1981, you know, the budget gap is narrowed down significantly. So this is a big achievement. And from then on, especially in the 90s and in the 2000s, Vietnam has done very well in terms of collecting revenues. At this you know, peak, we collect the revenue as big as 36% of our GDP, which is probably too much. All right. we, we, we can talk about that. That is too much. You know, we, we exploit our businesses and, 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 and people too much. But then after the financial crisis, that went down sharply. Think about 36% went down to 22%. And, and we are going to to address why, you know, why that is the case. It's very important. And, and what, what, is, uh, what I'm trying to do is trying to make sense of this picture all right, along the way. But the point is, Vietnam has been doing very well in the 90s and 2000s in terms of raising revenue. But we are not able to constrain expenditure. So if you look at uh, you know, the blue line, which is expenditure, is very high. And if you look at the red line, fiscal deficit is high as well. And it's not sustainable, right? We are going to get to this issue later on. Now let's look at uh, the composition of uh, revenue or revenue structure. Revenues in Vietnam come from four main sources. The first one is from state or enterprise, and you are working on state ent enterprise, right? So about uh, 20, you know, depending on the year, but about 15, 20% now of our budget comes from SOEs, and then from FDI, from private enterprises, okay? So this is one way to classify the revenue in Vietnam. But you think of the three together, private or enterprise, FDI and SOE, they are actually, the revenue are actually coming from two main sources. One is corporate income tax, and second, value added tax. All right. So, so the corporate income tax and value added tax together account for about 40% of our total budget. All right. And then you have personal income tax, which start very little about 2% of budget, and now in 2013, it's 5.7%, and in the most recent estimate of the budget in 2015, it's about 8%, which is a good sign. All right? If you compare to like Canada or the US, or more advanced economy, the, the personal income tax can account for like 30 to 40%, or even 50% of the total budget. In Vietnam now, it's increasing, which is a good sign. And then, 
you, you see a lot of revenue comes from oil and actually it went down significantly you know compared to the 2000 right from nearly 26 percent now less than 15 percent one thing is because we are running out of oil but the second thing is because of the oil price okay? and then this is important trade trade used to account for you know as high as 25 26 percent of our budget but now it's like 60 percent and that explains why our uh, revenue decline in recent years because we joined you know WTO in 2007 we signed a uh, bilateral trade agreement with Japan with South Korea with uh, EU and so on and so forth so that bring down the tariffs and therefore the import and export tax revenue decline significantly if you look at this you know, from 22 percent you know to like 15 percent in only two years not not it doesn't take a long time you know it takes only a couple of years to for that to happen and then there's another thing which is super important but is still uh, you know it's still politically difficult to tax which is land all right so actually what we are as economy trying to promote is a more broad-based and comprehensive property tax but in Vietnam, because of political reason, it's really hard to tax, you know, land and house. So that's why it's account for a small part of our revenue. But I think it's growing, you know, and, and that's a good sign as well. So basically, four sources of revenue for the Vietnamese budget is corporate income tax, VAT, uh, oil, and trade tax. Right, so these are you know, together accounting for about 75 to 80 percent of our total budget. And now let's talk about Vietnam major tax reform because when we talk about revenue, we need to talk about tax reform. And the first wave of tax reforms in Vietnam happened very early. You know, Remember, we started reform, uh, reforming our, con our economy in 1986 and in 1990, which is four years after, we implemented a very impressive and comprehensive tax reform. Right? And this is the reason why we was able to increase the revenue significantly in the 90s. Right? This is the main reason. So we uh, establish a revenue tax. At that time, we call it revenue tax. We will change the name later on. Excise tax, profit tax, high income tax. This is high personal income tax. All right. Import and export tax, natural resource tax, land tax, agricultural land tax, and we start the very first step to improve our public financial management system which is to try to get the contribution to budget by state invested institutions like SOEs. So for a long time before 90s, we didn't collect anything from SOEs except for the mandatory contribution. So no tax at all, all right? So basically, SOEs were not subject to taxation, but contribution, right? It's different, <coughs> you know, taxation is by law. Contribution is by, you know, cozy relationship at some time, you know. So basically, like, if you like, you know, if the leadership say, okay, this is important, like oil and gas company investing a lot, then you don't have to pay contribution for this year. But if that is the tax, then it should follow the law, right? So, so the system is very different. And another wave of tax reform, which is crucial, and I, I, I hope that at some point Myanmar is doing the same thing, is value added tax. This is probably one of the most important tax reform in Vietnam in the last two decades. And if you look back at the picture about revenue, this is helping us to increase revenue the most. And now value added tax account for 20 to 25 percent of total revenue, which is the biggest, the single biggest contribution to Vietnam's budget nowadays. Right? And then we establish, we introduce corporate income tax 
that replacing profit tax. Okay, so we we don't have revenue tax but value added tax. We don't have profit tax but corporate income tax. And and gradually we we uh, face out this one high income tax but be, becomes personal income tax. High income means only high income people will pay tax, but not, it's not a good way. Everyone who has income is supposed to submit tax form, right? Because it improves the tax, you know, management. But for high income, you know, for high income tax, the people who who have income but don't reach a certain level are not supposed to file the tax form, which is not good for administration. All right. So, so high income tax, high personal income tax is replaced by personal income tax, which is incre increasing that, uh, as I showed you earlier. And from 2000 on, we keep, you know, amending those tax. All right. Like we change this tax three or four times, almost in every five years, because it needs to keep up with the economy. You know, and during the process of implementing these tax laws, there's something that we learn along the process. Then we modify, you know, we make amendments to the original laws just to make sure that we have a modernized tax system. But the significance from 2001 on is tax related to trade. Okay, so we signed US Vietnam BTA in 2001 joined WTO in 2007 and in 2015 and 16 you know we have um, uh, ASEAN economic uh, uh, communities we have TPP of course it's technically that by the time being and EU Vietnam FTA which is subject to approval by EU uh, Congress but the thing is this period will see you know a lot of changes in terms of import and export tax <coughs> Now let me go to a second part of public finance, which is expenditure. And this is a structure of expenditure. Basically, you have investment expenditure, current expenditures, and then you know you can classify you know grants and others. And the thing is, investment expenditure and current expenditure in Vietnam account for about 90-92% of total budget already. All right. And if you look at this, there's two things which are very worrisome in Vietnam. One is the decline of investment expenditure, meaning that we are investing less relatively to our economy. Right? And at the same time, current expenditure is expanding, you know, from 50% here to nearly 70%, you know in 2013 and it's even higher in recent years so if you look at this you know for the current expenditure for the economy is about seven percent education we spend a lot and probably we, we discussed this about about this topic earlier uh, mr so -win. vietnam has a pretty good education system and we spend like if you look at this we spend about 17 percent of budget on education alone which is huge you know, if you think about that compared to other countries. And, uh, and public health as well, we spend about 6%. But I must, I must add that for Vietnamese people, health and education are the two top priorities. So if you think, if you, if you see the government spend about 17% of its budget on education, you must add an equal amount out of pocket spending. Vietnamese people spend a lot of money on education and let me give you one number. Every year Vietnam spend about three to four billion US dollars sending their kids abroad to study. Right now Vietnam has about nearly 30,000 Vietnamese students studying in the US alone. All right. So if you take the whole Vietnam has currently about more than 100,000 students abroad, which is a very, you know, high number. And some of them coming back, some of them don't, but that's okay. <laughs> 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 uh, 
And then the, 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 thing, the bad thing about spending is science and technology and environment. We spend less than 1%. Okay. The thing is not because we don't want to spend more. Actually, in, in the budget plan, it's reserved 2% on science, technology, and environments. But the disbursement is the problem. Right? It's not because the budget is not there, but the disbursement is so complicated that you know, they cannot disperse every uh, you know, bug that it has in the budget. Social insurance is a big, uh, you know, is, is, is good as well. You know, in Vietnam, actually, because it's that big, we, are, we have a concern that the insurance fund will be obsolete in the next you know, 10 to 15 years, which is a huge problem now. The Vietnamese people, Vietnamese government is working very hard on this one, trying to prevent the social insurance fund from going bankrupt. Because we spend too generously, you know, on on uh, social insurance and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is give you a, a broad picture about the structure of the spending. And now let me going back to the current expenditure and investment. If you look at this, the current expenditure is increasing, right? This is more recent uh, budget because it go through the estimate, so it's not final. Yes. So right now is the current expenditure in 2015 accounts for about 80%, which is way too high. All right. It used to be only about less than 60%. This one big problem. And it goes together with the decentralization process. I'm going to go back to that later on. All right. And then as a result, investment as a percentage of budget goes down significantly from like 33% now about uh, 19%. Okay, and then the last uh, item is the carryover from this year to the next one. All right. The problem is, if you look at this, oh, let me show you this next picture. It's even, uh, it's, it's, it's more clear. Okay, this is a little bit technical, but uh, please bear with me. So this is revenue. The blue line is revenue. The orange line is current expenditure. All right, and then. The gray line is principal and interest payments. So basically, this is the payment for previous borrowing. Okay. So when the government wants to invest, sometimes it has to borrow. And when you borrow, you have to pay principal and interest on that loan. All right. So if you look at this, one interesting thing just happened in the last couple of years is that the revenue, the budget revenue is not enough to finance current expenditure and to pay for principal and interest payment. Meaning that if the government wants to invest, it has to borrow. Right? And that makes the public debt you know, increasing. I'm going to go back to that. But this is a serious problem that the government is, is dealing with right now. And now I'm going to the third topic of my presentation, which is about decentralization. But before going to decentralization, I think it's important that you, you need to, you, you have a, uh, some understanding about our government structure, yeah. right? Otherwise, no, it's going to be our context. So, uh, we have uh, central government, we have four layers of governments. The central governments, the provincial governments, or we call it local governments, or sub-national governments, <coughs> right? And below provincial governments, you have district, and commune. So we have four layers. But you have only two levels of budget, which is central and local. All right? So province, provincial government is responsible also for the other two layers. So we used to have four, but it's too complicated. And uh, we call it nested budget. Nested in the sense that you have to put this guy 
you know, within this guy, within this, and within that. It's, it's making things so complicated and very non-transparent. So one of the important reform in terms of, of public finance management is to reduce the number of budget level from four to two, which makes a lot of sense. Okay, and then you know, within the governments, within the each level of government, you have a parallel you know representative uh, bodies. So at the central level, you have national assembly. At the local level, you have people council. At province, provincial level, district level, and commune level. So the idea is to have these people putting a check on this one, all right? But actually, they work together. You know, it's it's not like the division of you know the check and balance uh, uh, kind of thing that we 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 see in uh, Canada, <laughs> but. Uh, but here it's more like they work together under the leadership of the Communist Party. <laughs> so, so then you have ministry level, department and division level. And the, the, the point I'd like to make here is you have a parallel system. Okay? So for example, if you have like Ministry of Finance, and then at the provincial level, you have Department of Finance in Ho Chi Minh City, for example. And then this department report both to ministry, to line ministry, and to the local government. All right. It's making things complicated, you know, a little bit, but it's how it works. You will see how it plays out, you know, when we come to other topic. But this is important to remember. <coughs> now let's go, let's go and let's put the budget system in. All right. So this is a budget system. You have two two levels of budget. One is central budget or national, and one is provincial budget or local. And this level will be responsible for district budget and commune budget as well. Right? So we have only two levels of budget. And these guys, even though they have budget, but is subject to approval not from the, the people council, but from this guy. All right? And now there's different dimension of decentralization in Vietnam. Okay, you have central government, provincial government, and sub-local governments, right? Including the district and commune. And then this is the kind of uh, different dimension of decentralization. Political decentralization, administrative decentralization, fiscal decentralization, and market decentralization, all right? I add market here because Vietnam used to be so uh, centralized, all right? So common and control, you know, driven. So with market decentralization, a lot of function that was initially, you know, uh, taken care of by the government now is decentralized to the market. Which, I, which is, I think, the most important decentralization in Vietnam. It's not this, it's not this, it's not that. This one is the most important one. But normally people don't talk about this you know, in academic paper. But this is the most important one. All right. And what I'm talking today is about fiscal decentralization. But it needs to be related to the other two. Because in Vietnam, basically, the central government still want to keep political control. So basically, you know, the head of the province is picked by the party. The local people don't have any say, any voice in like electing the top leadership in the province, right? So there's virtually no political decentralization. There's little administrative decentralization, mostly delegation, all right? But this one has gone through significant changes and I'm going to talk more about this in the next couple of slides. And another thing to keep in mind is when you talk about decentralization, you need also to talk about the functional decentralization. Because for example, if the government decides that okay I'm going to decentralize, but I'm going to keep you know the planning and financing, then it doesn't make much sense. So so the measure of decentralization 
need to be you know sophisticated, needs to be nuanced. It's not something that okay, yes or no, zero and one, but it's the kind of the continuum, all right? And you need to take this thing into account. Okay, so first of all, let's look at the revenue sharing arrangement. And I think this is something uh, Vietnam and Myanmar is, are very different. In Vietnam, I think the, the, the revenue arrangement, revenue shares between the central and local government is quite clear. No, it's not as clear as we wish for, it's not ideal, but it's pretty clear. Okay, if you look at this. So, there are three kinds of, you know, revenues. One, the first group are revenues that collected and, you know, uh, assigned to central government, including trade tax. Why? Because trade policy is only meaningful at the central level. Right? You, you cannot have, you know, like Ho Chi Minh City or a province in Vietnam have trade policy. It's, it's not the case. That's why trade taxes go to the central budget. Similarly, you know, like uh, VAT and excise tax on import, right? Again, trade-related trade tax. And tax and other revenue from petroleum because it's natural resources, you know. It's not because, you know, the oil happened to be in Bari Vongto or Ho Chi Minh City, then revenue should go to that province. No, it is natural resources. It's national. So it should go to, to central government. And corporate income tax on enterprise with uniform accounting, meaning that it is managed by the central government. So the money goes to the center. It's, it's pretty clear. So there's a clear philosophy behind this division of revenue. And there's uh, another group of revenues fully assigned to local government on, on the left. Land and housing tax. Land is not movable. House, houses are not movable. So it should be local. right? And then natural resources tax, but excluding petroleum. Right? License tax, tax on transfer of land rights, fee on land. So many land related taxes are assigned to local government, okay? And then the interesting part is this, share revenue. So VAT, except on import, CIT, corporate income tax, except enterprises with uniform uh, accounting, which is this. And then personal income tax, excise tax on domestic goods and gasoline and oil fees and charge. This account for the biggest part of the budget for many provinces, all right? So that's why this is so important. And the point is, it is clearly announced at the very beginning, so there's no dispute, okay? There's not a dispute between the central and local level about which I should give and which I should send to you. It's pretty clear now. In the beginning, it was not that clear. And there was a lot of dispute between the local and central. But I think this is one of the most important reform that we did starting in 2002 and in 1992 when we first we have the first budget law and then it modified again in 1998 and again in 2002 and again in 2015 so four times already All right so this is the the latest one 2015 and now let's look at the results okay if you look at this, the green line is the local government decentralized revenue as percentage of total revenue, and it went up a lot from 27% to 38%. At the same time, the, the subsidy, subsidy from central government went down from nearly 50% to about 34%. So the point here is the local government has a lot of revenue and expenditure power. This is a real fiscal decentralization. We give a lot of power, fiscal power, to local governments. But I must say, local government in Vietnam are not allowed to set the tax rate. It's unified, right? But 
is a sign a certain revenue that it can collect and keep and then for the revenues that is subject to sharing the sharing ratio is clearly you know stated in advance i'm going to come uh, to that point uh, right now all right so this is the uh, 13 provinces that are the net budget contributors so vietnam has 63 provinces so 13 of them contribute to the budget and 50 of them receive transfer from the central governments. So there's a system of equalization and cross subsidization. And it's huge. I'm going to, 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 to show you. It's, it's huge. And, and it's on the one hand, it's good because it's, it's good for the equity and inclusion. But on the other hand, you know, those provinces who are the net contributors, we think that it's unfair to them. All right? So it's a, it's a common problem, it's everywhere. <laughs> For example, if you look at this, Hanoi, all right? So this is uh, Vietnamese million, and uh, the exchange rate now is about 22,000 Vietnamese dong for one US dollar. So you have some sense about how big it is, all right? So Hanoi, is the second biggest uh, province in Vietnam in terms of revenue, in terms of GDP, can keep only 42% of the share revenue. All right? And it's not that, that terrible. Ho Chi Minh City can keep only 33%, uh, 23%. But that was in previous term. In this term, this number is reduced to 18% which is a big punishment for Ho Chi Minh City. But a good news for everybody else. <laughs> right? Because Ho Chi Minh City can keep you know, that little. But you know, now the government has more money to distribute to 50 other provinces who cannot you know, uh, balance their budget. Okay? And if you look at this, like uh, Da Nang is another uh, uh, important city in the central coast of Vietnam, can keep 85%. Okay, so this is the picture about the share ratio. And this share ratio is maintained in every five years. So they call it the budget term. So every five years, this number is, nego is subject to negotiation between the local and central governments. It will start with the negotiation between the people committee at the local level and the Ministry of Finance. Then the Ministry of Finance will make a recommendation to the National Assembly and the National Assembly will give it to the Budgetary and Financial Committee to look at it and then this committee will make a recommendation for the Standing Committee of the National Assembly. The Standing Committee of the National Assembly will put it on the agenda for 50 MPs to vote on. 500, I'm sorry, 500 MPs to vote on. Complicated process. But the, the idea is, this is arranged and fixed in advance, so that you know that in the next five years, this is what you get, right? So, so uncertainty is basically, you know, reduced significantly. So I know exactly how much money I get in the next five years, all right? At least this is something I can control at the local level. But now, this is kind of an interesting part, which is equity. If you look at this, um, we divide the country into six regions. So the north, uh, northern mountain to the southwest of the Mekong Delta. Okay? And here, if you look at this, Ho Chi Minh City is here. And Hanoi is here. So in terms of revenue per capita, very high. But in terms of expenditure per capita, lower than the average. So this line is national average. It's about uh, 8.1 million Vietnamese dollar, all right? But for the Southeast region, they start with really high revenue. But because they have to send a lot of money to Hanoi, to the, to the central governments, the remaining money for expenditure is pretty low. 
That's why they start being rich and spending like a poor person by a, like a poor province. That is a serious problem. <laughs> you know, because it doesn't provide the right incentive for Ho Chi Minh City. Right? You, you earn more, you spend less. Doesn't make sense, but it's what's going on. All right? And if you look at this, Hanoi, similar but not as bad as Ho Chi Minh City. Okay? And then now let me look at Ho Chi Minh City. Okay, this is Ho Chi Minh City, the highest one. And you know, below the average. So, you know, and then this is the, some of the provinces that, who are net contributor to the budget that I showed earlier. So basically, they start pretty high, but many of them, at the end of the day, when the game is over, when it comes to expenditure, how much money you can spend on your average citizen, the number is lower than average. Right? So this is some issue that, that, that we are debating very hotly in Vietnam nowadays. And now uh, I'm going to the last part of my presentation, which is the PFM reforms. All right. So there are five areas. One is revenue management. As I said earlier, the problem is revenue is declining now as a percentage of GDP. The second, expenditure management. As I said earlier, the problem of declining investment expenditure, but increasing recurrent expenditure. The debt management. You know, the public debt is increasing, the SOE fiscal risk management, and public asset investment management. So let's go to the first one. This is the picture I showed earlier. All right. We, Vietnam has been very successful in the 90s and in the 2000s in terms of revenue. But in the last five or six years, there's a sharp declining in revenue as percentage of GDP. There are two main reasons for that. One is because of the slowdown of the economy. You know, we used to grow at 8.5% here, and now it's about 6.3%. Right? So the decline of you know, the slowdown of GDP growth, and secondly, because of the trade tax. Now we join, you know, we sign, and, and, and the trade agreements become, become effective in the recent years. The uh, budget coming from trade taxes uh, is reduced significantly. And as I said earlier, there's a problem of declining investment expenditure and sharp increase in current expenditure. Why? You know, big one is because the administration body is growing, especially it, it comes together with decentralization. When you decentralize, you give more power to the local governments. Local government build their empire right, by opening up more organization, establishing more organization. And the number of people who get salaries you know, from the local budget increases. And this one of the main drivers behind the increase of the current expenditures, which is very high. Look at this, you know, in the 2009, it's less than 50%, and now it's about 80%. It's amazing. So decentralization, if you don't manage it well, it can lead to this kind of consequences, all right? And together with the fact that inequality among provinces, right? And, uh, as I said earlier, you know, this picture, the problem now is in order to invest, Vietnamese government has to borrow. And when the Vietnamese government has to borrow, on the one hand, it adds up to public debt. And at the same time, it crowds out private investment. So two things, you know, at the same time. And when it crowds out private investment, the GDP growth could be declined. And then, you know, less revenue and then higher deficit. That is the kind of the, the, the very like uh, uh, virtuous circle, right? And uh, in terms of budget revenue, if you look around, like compared to China, Philippines, 
Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam. I'm sorry, I don't have Myanmar here because the data is not uh, publicly available. But and I don't know if that is correct or not. But so I, I take uh, you know some other comparative countries. So I don't think we have problem that much in collecting revenues because we are still pretty high compared to other countries in the region. You know, Vietnam is here only behind China, right? China is amazing. China uh, is able to maintain the, like, the revenue of about 27, 28% in the long period of time. We was able to do that in the 2000s into the, in the 90s, but now it's not the case. But Vietnam is, you know, quite, you know, in terms of budget, uh, revenue quite higher compared to other countries in the region. And now in terms of budget expenditure, again, this is actually more the problem. It's not because we cannot collect revenue. It's because we spend a lot. So this is where the problem is. All right? It's not with revenue, it's more with expenditure. And then, therefore, fiscal deficit. Five, you know, the, the problem is we, we, we have high fiscal deficit for a long period of time. You know, if you have fiscal deficit, which is uh, uh, cyclical, it's okay. You know, like one, two years, three years. But in the last decade, we have fiscal deficit of around 5 to 6%, which is a big problem. And therefore, it adds up to public debt. If you look at this, public debt in 2012 is about 55%. Now it's about 63%. And it's going to be 65% this year, which is relatively high. Of course, we are not Japan, we are not the US, and, but again, 50% can to be high for the country like Vietnam. And now we are 65. So you, if, if you link you know, problems together, it starts with expenditure. In order to finance high expenditure, we have to borrow. But some of the uh, expenditure is not efficient. Therefore, we don't get enough revenue to make up the difference, the fiscal gap. And therefore, we have to borrow more. When you have to borrow more, we add on the uh, public debt. And then, at the same time, we crowd out the private sector, and therefore, the slowing down, and that kind of thing. So everything goes together as a whole. And this is a very recent uh, report by the World Bank taking stock in July 2017. And if you look at this, one point is, okay, the public debt in 2016 is about 64% of GDP. But if you compare this picture to China, one good thing about this picture is local public debt is very small. If you look at China, it's not the case. Local public debt in China is huge. And a lot of that is shadow banking and that kind of thing. And it's not even transparent, all right? When I talk with uh, Chinese colleagues, I ask them the question, how big is the local public debt? And the answer is, no one knows exactly. Because it's local. It's very hard to, to, to monitor, especially many borrowings are off budget, not on budget. So, so basically, they don't know. Okay? But the, the, thing, the sure thing that we know is it's big, very big. All right? So, but in the case of Vietnam, we don't have problem of local debt. Local public debt account for about less than 1% of the total public debt, which is not a problem at all. So we have the, the government debt and the government guarantee debt. Most of the guarantee debts are either for SOEs or for some metro, metropolitan cities, right? not for the agricultural provinces, no, but for like Ho Chi Minh City, Hanoi, Da Nang, that kind of thing. And in terms of, you know, now I'm talking about the state uh, sector, most of them are SOEs. This is the, the picture about the i -Core, you know, I-C-O-R, the incremental capital output ratio. Basically, it tells you how many units of investment you need to produce one unit of GDP growth. You know, just put it simple, okay? And then here, for example, in the 90s, 
it takes like 2.8% of GDP investment to produce one percentage point of GDP growth. Now it's about 5.4. But look at the state sector, 3.9, 8.7, which is about 143% of the average. So this number shows the inefficiency of the state sector. But at the same time, the state sector or SOEs are considered to be the backbone of the economy by the Communist Party. It's just ideological, you know, it's just political. So this is the kind of dilemma of Vietnam nowadays. The biggest dilemma now is on the one hand, the Communist Party want to, want to maintain its performance legitimacy. And in order to do that, it has to deliver growth. But on the other hand, because of you know, political reason, it has to keep an efficient sector at the center of the economic model. So this is the dilemma now. Okay? The, and and I, I think that uh, that is a fundamental political economy about, uh, dilemma. And how that dilemma plays out will determine our trajectory of development in the next decade or so. This is the most important one. And now let's go to, into details of the public financial management issues in Vietnam. And this is the um, agenda for reform in the coming years for Vietnam. One is budget preparation. One problem in Vietnam is the recurrent and capital spending or expenditures are not fully integrated. One reason is because the capital spending is in the domain of the Ministry of Planning and Investment. I know you have similar thing here, mm -hmm. but you have Ministry of Finance yeah. is responsible for current spending, MPI responsible for setting the priority for capital investment. This is one problem that we need to resolve. And at some point, Vietnam, you know, the, the, the CIM, which is the most important thing in Vietnam, recommends to merge the two ministries together into the economic or uh, economic ministry of ministry of economy but but uh, the two ministries don't like that idea so. <laughs> <laughs> but i think that's a good you know that you know basically one one guy come up with you know investment list the other come up with the money and they don't talk to each other that much you know that that's some problem that we need to resolve and then ensure that annual expenditure planning align with the medium-term expenditure framework. And actually, no, this is something important because I know that Myanmar is going through this exercise. At the local level, it's a big problem. Okay, why? Remember in Vietnam, you have 63 provinces. 50 of them don't get enough money to finance their expenditure. So they don't even know next year how much money they have, let alone medium term. You see the problem? So, so in order to finance many of their projects, they need to look for subsidies from the central governments. So actually the medium term fiscal you know, expenditure framework applies okay at the central level. But when you bring it down to the local level, you need to be more careful. And Vietnam is experiencing that problem right now, okay? For cities like Ho Chi Minh City or Hanoi or Da Nang, it's not a big deal because they, they, they have money and they can control it partly. But for the other 50 provinces, it's not easy, right? Because they don't know, you know, how much money they can have so that they can foresee, you know, medium term. And uh, another thing is to minimize the gap between plans and actual budget. And it has a lot to do with one, fiscal discipline, and two, fiscal decentralization. Let me pick up fiscal discipline first. So the way it works in Vietnam is, okay, you have the budget. And then the executive branch can say, I'm going to use invest, uh, investment budget for project X, Y, and Z. But at the end, when the project needs more money to finance, then if it is within like 30%, 30% of the initial budget, 
then it doesn't have to go through the whole process. And so you see, you know, 20%, 25%, 29%, you know, overspending. But then it doesn't, that, that, it doesn't have to go through the complicated process again. And that's why at the end, the, the, the planning budget and the actual budget are different. How can you finance the difference? You look up to the central government. So the local government will push that burden upward to the central government. It's a big problem now. All right. So this is for budget preparation. For budget coordination, as I said earlier, investment budget priority set by MPI. So MPI should coordinate with MOF, with Ministry of Finance. Okay. Executive discretionary authority in changing budget appropriation, I just mentioned this, you know, should be more in line with the legislature to enhance budget credibility. Because, you know, the thing is, like this year, your budget is over by like 30%. Next year, nobody will believe your budget, right? People will build that into expectation that, okay, this year, we are going to get, you know, extra 20, 25% of the budget. So they don't, you know, follow the budget closely and the budget dis disciplines will be eroded. Right? And then in terms of budget transparency, the approved budget doesn't present information for all programs. So if you look at this, you know, the, the item called others, very big. No one knows exactly what's going on there. All right? So if you look at many programs, you, know, you, don't, you don't really know exactly the the, the, the uh, financial information for those program. The second point is fiscal risk and reporting on public debt is not fully disclosed. And actually, to be fair, Vietnam has done a very good job in putting budget uh, data online. Draw many pictures that you already saw, but it's not enough. Okay, it's good but not not good enough. So because many. Uh, many data on public debt is not that transparent. Anyway, in the last uh, couple of years, under the support of uh, international organization, now every six months, MOF is supposed to publish the, uh, the so-called public debt update, which is a good thing. But the most recent public debt update is in 2015, which is about two years from now and they're supposed to update it every six months. So it's there, but it's not that, you know, updated. Uh, uh, there is no consolidated rep reporting of extra budget activities. Okay, this is something which is technical. Think about ODA, for example. ODA in Vietnam is not recorded as on budget, but off budget, all right? And we don't know that, because it's not on budget, it's not reported. Uh, project financing, okay, so you want to uh, build a road, that road is financed by raising bonds, issuing bonds here and there, it's not on budget, it's not recorded. But the biggest part is expenditure by military and security apparatus, you never get any sense of how big it is. You know that it's big. You don't know how big it's big. Right? So there's a lot of extra budgetary activities that you don't know. All right? It's big. And final account delay, audit report with significant time lag. And Vietnam still scored poorly in fiscal transparency. I think about four years ago, we scored like 19, 0.19, 19%. Right now, it's about 25, which is improving, but still pretty low. Uh, the minimum is about 20%. You know. if, if it's below 20%, meaning that it's not transparent. Now we are about 26. Uh, local government finance. As I said earlier, the local government in Vietnam don't have big problem with debt. But we still have problem with you know, targeted transfer. The thing is, in Vietnam, there's different, several ways in which the central government may maintain the equity among provinces. One is equalization program. Second is targeted program. 
For example, the targeted program on you know, poverty alleviation, uh, tar targeted programs on climate change, and so on and so forth. So for those provinces that suffer from those problems, the government will have targeted funding to target directly those provinces. Okay? But the problem is the targeted transfer is now more input driven than performance based or output driven. So basically, province will get that transfer anyway. It's not based on performance, right? So we need to change the, the governance. And the capacity of, of oversight institution is uh, limited. We have National Assembly and State Audit of Vietnam, which is part of the National Assembly, but it's really hard for these two institutions to get access to data. I am, uh, you know, I am working closely with the uh, Economic Committee of the National Assembly. Basically, in, uh, uh, before any uh, general session, I, were, I am invited to give a kind of, of, of presentation to the whole uh, Economic Committee. And the problem is, in order to make my analysis, to do my analysis, I need to get data from the Ministry of Finance, from MPI, and so on and so forth. And the law, you know, basically requires them to submit the data and submit information. But the thing is, they submit it too late. Normally, by Vietnamese law, it requires that the Ministry of Finance and MPI submit the report to the National Assembly at least three weeks in advance. Three weeks is not that long. But normally they submit it like seven days or ten days in advance. And, and you know, as a member of the National Assembly, you don't have enough time to work on it. And then you have to, to discuss about it on the general session of the National Assembly. It's just impossible, right? So, so, so basically, data is a monopoly power. Okay, who has data has power. So that's why they try to prevent, you know, providing data to National Assembly. The revised budget law that I just mentioned, all right, so we had the most recently revised uh, law on, uh, on state budget in 2015. And this is the four areas that, we are, that Vietnam is working on. The first one introduced medium-term fiscal and expenditure framework, as I just mentioned earlier. The second one is further clarify the roles and responsibility and definition and classification like debt, revenue, expenditure, and the content of fiscal and financial report. So even though it's pretty clear now, there's room for improvement. And the third issue with this budget law is the provision to improve community oversight of the state budget. So basically, in the law, there's some clauses that require community participation in the budgeting process, which is a good thing to do. And lastly, there must be a frequent reporting on the effectiveness of public spending by line ministry and relevant agencies. And I want to, to make sure you understand that in Vietnam, MOF is a single authority that collects tax, unlike the case in Myanmar. I, I know that the, the issue in Myanmar is much more complicated. Many uh, authority, many organizations at various levels can collect uh, revenue. In Vietnam, only Ministry of Finance. Okay? The, the custom office is belong to Ministry of Finance, and no other you know, ministry or organization can collect tax. But the public spending, you know, the, the expenditure is carried out by many different uh, ministries and, and, and relevant agencies, and they need to be, you know, more frequent reporting, right? So I think I'm going to stop here and welcome any questions, discussion, and comments. Thank you.